paper too. You'll be doing your closer on it as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, Sloan. Yes. What am I? Evil. Why am I evil? Um, because I can probably get an A and pass that SOL test without doing homework every night. I have other classes and other commitments outside of school as well. Okay. Am I evil to everyone? No. <laughs> Why am I not evil? I said that you're good because you're helping me to succeed and success is important to me, but you need someone to push you to become great. Okay. Are there any other reasons why I might be good? Maybe my general handsomeness? Well, obviously. <laughs> I said homework equals practice, and you can't get perfect scores without practice. Okay. Okay. Any other reasons why I would be evil? Sorry, Brittany. Not your okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not crying over it yet. I might cry, you know, once I leave. But okay, so that's those are good. Those are good ideas, and we're going to be talking about that. And we yesterday we kind of talked about Otto von Bismarck, and we talked about how his role in the German unification and um, kind of what he did. But today we're going to take a little bit more of an in-depth view of that. And what we're going to do is the question for today is how should we think of him? Should we think of him? As good or evil? Should we, how should we think of Otto von Bismarck? The objective, there are two, only one of them is on the board. The first one is that you will be able to uh, analyze primary sources um, of Otto von Bismarck's time about what he did and how people thought of him. And the second one is you are going to be able to reflect on Bismarck's role in the unification of Germany. And the SOL is uh, World History 2, 8 point D which is the, uh, that you will be able to account for uh, Germany being a, becoming a nation state later than the rest of Europe. Um, and so I sent you guys an email. Um, you guys have an email with a file in it, and I want you to go ahead and open up that file. And that file is, it says DBQ, and I, know a lot, I heard a lot of groans over that, but it's a little bit different. You're not going to be writing a paper or anything like that over this. Um, the goal, and it's, it looks something like this, and the goal here is that you've got eight sources here, and um, this is going to be, not free time, but you're going to have about 15 minutes to take this and look over it. And the goal would be that after each document, you're going to write down a comment about this. And the prompt, uh, Amanda, can you read the prompt for us? Um, the bold part. The bold part, yes. Okay. Prince Otto von Bismarck could be considered Machiavelli's model for the ideal ruler in that he, he was feared by his people and he used any ends to justify his tactics he used in bringing about the unification of the German states. Okay, so does anybody here remember who Machiavelli is? We studied him about probably two or three weeks ago. He wrote The Prince. He wrote The Prince, and what was The Prince about? Um, it's kind of like a guide of how to rule about... Um, is that the one where he says that... All power corrupts. Oh, that one. Yeah. Uh, better to be feared than loved. It's better to be feared than loved. That's one of the two major things out of it. And what's the other real big idea that he has? Does it, anybody remember what the other big idea that we pull out of Machiavelli? Is it? This, this one is an SOL. Is it all power corrupts absolutely? Absolute power? Is that no. the other one? Yeah, that is a good one. That's one to know. Um, it's that the ends justify the means. Machiavelli had the idea, he was writing to the Florentine leaders at the time, uh, the Medicis, and he uh, had said that the ends justify the means of whatever you're doing. And so I want you to take this, um, and it says on here, you're going to be, this is a participation grade, so you need to make sure that after each document, you're putting some form of comment, um, whether this makes, this paints Bismarck in a good light, whether it paints him in a bad light, um, what it says, 
uh, kind of, you can dumb it down into common language, because this is kind of older stuff. So I want you guys to go ahead and start, get started. You'll have about 15 minutes. You'll have about, let's say about until 8.40, uh, to go ahead and uh, work on all this. And I'm going to be coming around and checking on you guys and asking you guys uh, some questions about it. So go ahead and get started. <laughs> And if you wouldn't mind, I would love for you guys to uh, put comments on there as you type um, and get that to me. And if anybody actually, if anybody wants a paper copy, there is a paper copy available in case you don't work that well uh, with the computer. to a monarch, and so the idea of how socialism ties into that.
so uh, real quick on document C. So that might not make sense um, because you guys haven't, you guys really didn't learn this, but the uh, the EMS telegraph that was sent was actually doctored by Bismarck to insult the French king in order to spark the Franco-Prussian war. That's one thing that you guys need to be aware of as you read that. If it does not become perfectly clear. As you read it. The, uh, all of the, everything there, the uh, prince of Hohenzollern was a, uh, nominated to rule Spain. And what ended up happening is that the French didn't want it um, and so uh, Bismarck made sure that he insulted the French while also not giving, while also giving into their demands to spark the Franco-Prussian War. Very good image that he's painting there. Here's a very stately man. So, document E, what does that look like? Is it like they're, I'm say it's like their national song? Yeah, it's a national anthem. It's translated into English, obviously. Um, yeah. But it is the German national anthem. He's calling for some sort of thing, I guess, to unite the people. So I guess he's trying to put all these groups together and create one nation rather than several nations, I guess. I have no idea. 
So, so yesterday we learned about the German states, the German Confederation, which was formed, and learned that this was a few days ago as well. Uh, after the Congress of Vienna, there was this coalition confederation of German states, and there were 39 different German states that were within the borders. And so you got the Bavarians, you got the Berlin, Berliners, you got all of these different. You share something. You guys have five, like about five more minutes, and go ahead. And I want you to also consider, um, as you're finishing up, um, some questions that you might have about some of the uh, some of the texts. If something doesn't make sense to you, um, anything like that. As you're reading towards the end, um, keep in mind um, that uh, Bismarck is considered the, the father of uh, the German state. That he, uh, it was his baby, if you will. It's quite bad. It's too many waffles. Yes. Is he the one saying it? Yeah, Villain the Second is the, um, and we kind of talked about this yesterday, and I haven't, we haven't touched on it today yet. Um, Villain the Second is the uh, Kaiser at the start of World War One, 
And he, in fact, when he came to power in 1890, he uh, dropped Bismarck as prime minister, um, saying almost that his ideas were too old-fashioned. Um, because at that time, when he took over, Germ the German Empire was formed, and it was quite powerful. And he felt that he did not need this work anymore. Okay, guys, just take one, one or two more minutes to go ahead and finish up your thoughts and questions and anything like that you have, and then we'll get into our discussion of it. Understood everything that was in there. I didn't understand document C. Document C. Okay. Yeah, a lot of okay. Well, we're gonna the wording, I think. we're gonna talk about that as a group here, uh, just in a few minutes. So. All right, guys. So if you guys want to just uh, put your eyes up on me, and um, we're gonna go ahead and move into the next. On your table, you're gonna have a sheet that looks something like this. You can go ahead and flip it over, and this is, we're going to have a, what's called a fishbowl discussion. A fishbowl discussion uh, has two layers, so there's going to be an inner circle, where there's going to be three or four of you um, having a discussion, that you can bring, um, with, I guess with your computers, with, your, with everything that you uh, have commented on. You're going to have a discussion about the prompt, about whether Bismarck is Machiavelli's ideal ruler and maybe some questions you had about the documents and things like that. Um, and the outside people, while they're doing that, you've got a form here um, where in the directions say that you need to write down the names of your classmates. You can write down the names of all your classmates within it. You can go ahead and do that right now. So you can go ahead and get that done while you're thinking about it. So right, you can just write down first names. And... So this is going to be a, uh, a form of assessment. I want you guys to be sure to participate in some way. Um, and it's going to be a very low curve. Um, I'm not going to let you know what it is, but if you talk, you will do just fine on that curve. Um, and so what I'm hoping is that um, we'll spark good conversation. And you want to mark down every time they have a positive comment about... Um, they're being positive towards everything and they're not getting off subject. A negative comment is a comment that's directed towards a person that might be hurtful or a, uh, a comment that is off topic. Um, so to make sure that people are in line. So you want to make sure that to mark down those. And then also you need to mark down the number of questions that they ask. Uh, any questions that you hear. Um, and in fact, if you want to, you can put me down on there is I'm gonna I might be asking questions and I might be making comments and so you can kind of grade me on my uh, participation. And so I think for the first group um, we're gonna just meet we're gonna meet around this table and so um, if you want to uh, let's have Jeff, Amanda and Aaron uh, as the first three. If you could uh, I know the, the computers are a little clunky um, but bring those around and then the rest of you if you could come around uh, the outside of them and go ahead and be ready to um, to make your marks. And if you need anything to write on, I've got a few things. If you need something to write on, I think you're good. So and while you're inside, I don't think about I don't know if I made this clear enough. You do not make the time marks while you're in. So the time marks with people on the outside. That way you can focus in on your questions. Um, and so 
I figure I'll go ahead and get you started um, and then see where it goes. So on document A, um, he makes a lot of comments, and uh, Jeff pointed this out, he makes a lot of comments on socialism. Um, is, that, is that a good or is that an evil thing? Is that a Machiavellian thing? Um, is it something that is going to make him feared? Is it something that is going to make him loved? Did the ends justify the means? Can you talk a little about social democratic programming? It's talking a lot about welfare and taking care of the old people, making sure people have what they need to survive. So I feel like that's something that make him loved and not necessarily feared. It only does that that people don't contribute. They won't be able to be a part of that system. I don't feel like that's him instituting a system of fear. It seems to me that he's for some of the ideas of socialism. Like he, he likes that people have the right to work, and they've got health care, all, all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, he says, do not stand upon the ground of socialism. He's against kind of socialist programs. So on the one hand, he's making himself look good to everybody else because it's for the little guy. But he's also doing something very subtle and saying that, you know, I'm for all these ideas, but I'm not for you. And the you is democratic socialism. So he's like doing two things at the same time, setting himself up as you know, a good guy, but also saying I'm in opposition to these people. They have some good ideas, but they're doing it wrong. I wrote that, um, just kind of going off what you said, the power through giving is more like love rather than power through insertion of authority. Nowhere in there does he talk about any kind of punishment or any kind of, um, if people don't give into the system, it doesn't say there's any sort of punishment besides they don't get the benefits, which doesn't really, um, doesn't really seem that he's asserting his authority in a way, which would be about Kabbalah. Okay. So, can I move on to document me? Sure. Yes, it's, a, it's, um, it's your conversation. I think part of the problem was, was just finishing reading some document A, and there's some, uh, some overflow here, but there also seems to be some tension, so I don't think, I honestly don't know how I feel about this one. What do you guys think? Is it good or bad? I think this one just sounds like some important to me. Oh, God. I think this one sounds more bad than the first one. But I would argue that, but then again, he's just talking about a problem. He's not talking about, when I think Machiavelli, I think assertion of power. Like, that's the end all be all. And here he's just talking about a problem of poor people not putting into the system and socialist quacks and that sort of thing. So, so, so does that have more to say about Machiavelli or Bismarck? But my point is, there is that, you know, my understanding of Machiavelli has to do with more of a subtle kind of manipulation rather than kind of the, okay. the blunt force uh, awareness. So, so then, if that's the case, then him saying, don't listen to these people, then that would go right along with it. And it also falls more with, like, the ends justify the means. With these in there saying, you know, hey, these people that, uh, you know, you would think you should read up out to you and support and things like that. It's like, oh no, they're going to be the 
pregnancy. This was the one that Brandon told us was edited by well, his microphone. And that definitely kind of plays some good context right. for us because it's, you know, it's showing Bismarck being manipulative, which to me is more compelling. How is uh, being manipulative Machiavelli? What's the uh, I know you don't know much about Machiavelli, but you do know his major credo, which um, is that the what? Well, if we rely upon the idea that, that the end justifies the means, then however you go about doing it, whether it's through editing the document, whether it's through subtly backhanding compliments or something, you know, saying one thing and then saying the exact opposite but making it sound all nice, it's, it's still uh, can you guys go back to document I? I think, uh, or down to the document, um, the last uh, political cartoon. We kind of had a uh, short discussion on that. And we're going to change out our groups. Who's the big strong man? Bill Nye. Or Bill Nye. Or is that his name? With the mustache. Oh, okay. It looks to me like he's trying to balance between peace and war. He's able, you know, to keep a foot in both arenas, but it doesn't look like he's actually going anywhere. It's almost like he's playing with fire. He could go one way, he could go the other. He's kind of got his foot in, you know, his finger in both pots. But as I mentioned to Mr. Sexton earlier, you notice that he's, so Peace is a donkey. He's not a very well-fed donkey. Uh, and you got a really nice, rare to go war horse and he's facing towards war. You know, that's the direction he's leaning towards. So kind of like the perception of peace would mean him being weak. Because it's a, a donkey. So if he were in peace time, he would feel like he was not conquering or you know, would be a, a weak a weaker leader. Whereas in war he has you know, he's stallion. The All right, guys, if we can just switch out um, to the four of you that are on the outside now, I want you to come on in. Um, and then the three of you that are on the inside, move on out and be sure to grab your tally sheet and uh, make your time for us. And we're going to start. Um, you guys can start with Dr. McGee. I got it. Um, Document D, um, reflections or reminiscences of uh, Otto von Bismarck. What I got from this was kind of more of a balance between fear and love because he's talking about kind of having a dynasty and how you need to have a dynasty of power. And to me, that's saying you need to have a strong state. But then he's also talking about, like, not necessarily a revolution, but kind of a change in it up kind of thing. So it's like, you can have a strong state, but if people hate you, they may kind of have that resentment and try and overthrow or make a change. So it's, I don't think this is much about fear more than love. It's kind of like striking the balance between the two. I kind of went for the unification of Germany, and it made me think of that image from the U.S. American Revolution with the snake all broken up with the, the states. That's what it made me think. Yeah. The current party Is it? I have no idea. But that's where I kind of went with it. I thought that was a good thing, um, trying to join all of the, what was it, 29 Confederate German states together as well. Yeah, I kind of went with the same way that Jenny went, that um, for the German, the different German states must unite together to form one entity. I felt like, I mean, I might have gotten so wrong, but that he wanted the people to be dependent upon the government, and I wasn't sure if that was a good thing. Yeah, that kind of goes along with what kind of Chris was saying, the balance and um, having a strong government. Okay, so if you want to, go on and uh, 
Let's uh, go to the, uh, somebody pointed out it's the national anthem of Germany. Um, how does that reflect um, Bismarck's uh, footprint? Where's his hand? Where's his thumbprint on that? He talks a lot about taking action, I guess. And if he did tamper with that telegram, it kind of goes along with that. If he's trying to go to war with France. He's an instigator. Yeah, I think that's bad. Yeah, he's like trying to yeah, instigate like the workers. This was very Marxist to me. Had like comrades in there, had like rise you workers from your slumbers. So I, I kind of thought like proletariat, that kind of stuff. Um, and also, something interesting was uh, they, sh they soon shall hear the bullets flying, we'll shoot the generals on our own side. So it's kind of like doing whatever it takes uh, to kind of get what you want, whether it's shooting people on your own side. So that was kind of interesting. Um, let's, uh, let's go from here. Let's uh, go over document F and go to uh, document G, which is the, um, the poll, the opinion poll uh, in Berlin. Um, what does that say about uh, Bismarck and his perception? One question is greatest statesman, and the other question is greatest hero. So there's clearly a difference because Bismarck gets statesman, maybe for the unification part, consolidating power and doing that. But when it comes to hero, it's Wilhelm the um, first. So it's like that brings me back to the whole fear rather than love thing. That maybe they loved Wilhelm, uh, but they feared Bismarck. Well, I hate to cut you guys short, um, but we're going to have to uh, call it for now. Um, and the prompt, I want you to do a 3, 2, 1, um, back at your desk for your closer. And I want you to, is he the ideal ruler? I want you to put yes, uh, Machiavelli's ideal ruler. I want you to put yes or no. I want you to give three reasons as to why he would be viewed as the ideal ruler. I want you to give two reasons why he's not the ideal ruler. And I want you to try to write a thesis statement. Did you say Machiavelli or Bismarck? Bismarck. Is he, Bismarck, Machiavelli's ideal ruler? After your discussion that you've had and looking through these documents. And I want you to give, and it doesn't really show up that well, but I want you to give three reasons for, I want you to give two reasons, three reasons for which way you choose, two reasons against the way you choose. And then I also want you to write one sentence that is your thesis statement.
right, let's let's shift to the uh, tuning protocol, please. And one of the key things is to, to give Brandon some of the stuff that you've done, like that, those notes you're taking, so you can use them and look at people's uh, comments and things like that as well. Okay, just give you guys a couple of seconds just to um, orientate yourself. We're going to yeah. do clarifying questions first. If we forget to structure form goals and content of the lesson. lesson. Then we'll do the feedback warm and then push in. Remember that we're looking at it through different lenses as well. But it, don't let that hinder you in your comments. Yeah, please don't. Got other ones. I spelled Brandon B R A N D U N. <laughs> yeah, that's how I it. Tier line, total win. <laughs> All right, then. Clarifying questions, please. What was the unit? Uh, what was the lesson before this one? The lesson before this one is a look at well, the failed revolutions of 1848, which is okay. kind of its own SOL, very vague sort of thing, um, and also the steps to German unification. And so when you get through the Austria, the Austria Prussian War, uh, the uh, Franco Prussian War, the Denmark, the Danish War, um, and you go through all those steps. Um, and so you kind of have an idea going into this lesson of the means by which Bismarck did what he did, which is why I kept, kept making comments about what was happening because I realized that it was it's not specifically in this this lesson. So. Yeah. How was that going to be structured? Like, um, well, the, the goal would have been, about. yeah, uh, the goal would have been that they would have all done it um, at the um, within one group. So it'd be six, like, let's say six in the middle, and it'd be eighteen on the outside. But after looking at that and the way that that went, um, I think that it would be shifted from may maybe even two separate groups where you have six watching, six, and then you shift those out. Um, but the issue becomes then my personal listen in and that sort of stuff. But it was going to run a very similar way. And part of the reason why I did this was to see how it would run um, if I did run it. And, so, and obviously I ran out of time. Um, but. Would they have these documents to read at home before coming into class, or would you give them time to read it in as discussed in class? Uh, the goal would be that they would do it in class, um, because I think unless I mean unless it's given a certain assessment, like um, unless I add a question or two after each document to have them answer and then send that with them for homework and then have them bring it in and then do the fishbowl discussion, um, that would work. But the way that it's set up currently, that would that, that, that would not be the way that it would go.
the clarifying questions. How do you feel <clears throat> personally about the uh, the excerpts you used? Like, do you think that they are some of them are a bit difficult, or do you think that? I think some of them are a bit difficult, and like the example that you had was you had struggled with that political cartoon of the Ragstag, which was essentially the idea that the parliament was his baby, that he, he created the German state, and thus he was allowed to do whatever he wanted because he was basically the father or the mother in that image, but because uh, he completely controlled it, and that was kind of covering, I guess, the day before, and talking a, a little bit at, about that, but... Um, um, I think that, I mean, I basically I took a DBQ that they had had on, I found online, and I read through it, and I, I understood how everything had worked, and then I added to that. I added the political cartoons. I kind of shifted some stuff around um, to kind of make it my own um, to ensure that there was a variety of texts and stuff like that. In it. Um, but, yeah, I think there are some things in there that are difficult, and I think the, the socialism thing is kind of a distractor from the Machiavelli thing, which I noticed as we were going through the conversation that that came up. Uh, but, that, I mean, that in itself is also an SOL that has to be covered. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see that uh, come out. But, um, but yeah. So which concepts would they not be familiar with then? Like, they wouldn't be familiar with socialism. Did they, um, they wouldn't know socialism. It's been covered a little bit before. Um, they wouldn't really. They would be familiar with Machiavellianism. Uh, the idea of real politic, which didn't really come out in that um, as much as I'd hoped, um, and then the unification. The idea of the unification are the two concepts that come out really out of this lesson. Um, the real politic. They're both somewhat covered in the previous day, but this is kind of the realization of them within, because the SOL is strictly. The essential understanding is that Otto von Bismarck uh, was Otto von Bismarck's role in German unification, and he's he's the main person that they need to know. And so, kind of linking that to that, and there's the real politic is it's a, is a part of the SOL, as is um, his role as the prime minister. Um, what inspired you to change the closing? Um. It wasn't, I didn't think that it was going to, I didn't have enough time, so I felt like giving that structure to it would help. Um, and uh, it's always good to have both sides of the argument, um, because that, that makes you think twice as much about what's happening. And so... Before class, we were talking, how you came up with some ideas on the walkover. Some of, the modifications. Um, some of the modifications, and I didn't really do any of them um, just because of, I think it was for time's sake and the discussion's sake, and one of them was to discuss each document as you went through, um, but I felt at the time, and I might change this, but that it would be a distractor to the conversation at the end within the fishbowl, that you kind of already discussed it, so why discuss it again? Um, and then I think another idea was actually the homework idea of making sure that the students have seen this before and that they've looked over it and then spending the entire day in a sort of fishbowl discussion. And Well, not the entire day, but they've seen it. They've dissected it outside of class, so there's a conversation happening and not so much a dead time. Um, so. Do you have any concerns about them? Because you can't imagine, if we did this four times, there'd be a repetition. Is there any concern about that with regard to... Um, I think the, the idea would be to kind of shift through the documents as they did. Um, kind of look at half the doc, like you would look at certain documents within each group, um, with each, each group as they're going in. Because it's a, it's a singular conversation within, but the entire thing is one conversation because everyone has heard it. And so they're moving in and saying, okay, take what you've just heard and apply it to document. We're going to go to document C now, like apply everything that you've heard so far and bring it into the into this next, okay, you're coming in, it's document E, or you're going into the next document, and let's take in what you've taught, what we've talked about, already. say socialism, okay, where does that come out here? Or the idea that he's feared, is he feared here? Um, is he loved here? And kind of taking what's happening and kind of organically throwing it in um, as they were going. So Anything else you want to say?
Any more? Okay, let's go to world feedback, please. I like the primary sources. I thought I think it's good for students to work with them, especially in a DBQ format, and especially if it's an AP test or an SOL test. Um, <clears throat> going along with that, I liked the variation of sources too that you used. It wasn't. And I think there was, like, differentiation in that. Like, some of them were harder, but some of them were political cartoons, so they were easier. I like that you would sit down next to us and watch us and see how we're doing and if we're confused and try to pull ideas out of us. I like that you came around, and when you noticed that a lot of us were struggling with certain things, you gave us the background content that we needed. And, like, so even in the classroom setting, had you had covered that before... You know, it was good that you you could pick up on needing to remind us. I think it adapted well for time. I'm not exactly sure when the bell would have rang, like, when we were working and stuff, but I feel like we were still able, hardly, to talk a little bit about it. And I, I think that going through the sources and making your comments is just as important as the discussion part, so... I mean, if we got cut short, we were still working with sources and making our own uh, inferences about them. So. We anticipated the set was quick, it was tight, and we could, um, and it linked with, you know, something they could relate to. Let's go to uh, uh, pushing feedback, please. About teacher view, student view, things like that. There were some moments when I was confused, um, and I'm trying to think of this as a student. Uh, you give the verbal directions, but you're covering so much material. So when I get to reading the the documents and trying to figure out how I'm supposed to respond, I can't remember what questions you're trying to get me to look at specifically. I couldn't remember that you wanted me to answer X, Y, and Z, namely get to the point where is this an example of a Machiavellian prince or not. Um, and also, this is both pushing and, and, and uh, warm. I like that you were giving us the context that you saw, uh, that we needed it, but with some of these materials you're trying to read, and focus and outside conversations and distractors are going on, including your comments. So, you know, it's trying to, you know, I liked it when you did the whole, uh, okay, we're done now, set your, you know, set your pin down and kind of focus on me. You know, so maybe, maybe incorporating that a little bit, uh, especially when you're giving such important uh, context for reading and understanding these texts. And then my only other thing is, I feel like there was a little bit of confusion um, between Bismarck is good or evil, and Bismarck as the ideal prince. I think it would help if you displayed the two main ideas of prince, maybe written up there, so <clears throat> I've never read it, so it would have helped me, and just... If that's in the standards, that's like 1500s, this is 1800s, so it could have been a bit of late, like earlier on in the course, so they may have just need, needed a refresher, and having a visual may, have, uh, may help that. Um, this has kind of already been touched upon, but um, you did accommodate really well for when you ran out of time. Um, but maybe try to modify it somehow if you did give it um, for homework, let the students see the sources first, or maybe um, try to monitor where they are and like tell the students, kind of guide them to be like, all right, you guys should be moving on to document B now. You know, you guys should be moving on. That way, because um, I, I didn't get through all the documents and I was just moving slow, but that way people kind of cover them. But that could also be done if you let the students see it for homework. One suggestion that if you're struggling with time, as you can maybe split the documents up so we know ahead of time what our fishbowl 
questions are going to be, but I also kind of have a problem with that because when we're kind of judging the other fishbowl, we may be a little bit confused. So that's kind of just to just think about maybe how that would work. I think if you were to assign it for homework or like at least give them the documents beforehand, that could be a, just a good scaffold there for readers who may take a longer time. Another way to do that, this may be a problem, is to break it up into two days. You do the document analysis on day one, you give them a lot of hooks, a lot of chances to, to read and interpret the text, and then day two is fishbowl. You do a couple of small fishbowls and then you do like the classroom. Okay, so what's the view of all this taken together? Personally, I like the idea that you've got there for the closer, but I found it difficult. Like I could find two reasons for one, but I couldn't necessarily think of the opposite. And I think I was too focused on the whole the ends justify the means and better to be feared than the loved kind of ideas. But I, I especially like the idea of getting to that what would be a thesis. What would be what would be an essay question? It could have just been that and get to the thesis and the center because you know you have a great title, good states are all evil genius, but I never knew that until I looked at the lesson plan. I, I really, I mean, I mean, I might be able to. And then when I looked at your question, how should we think of Otto von Bismarck? My response is about what is German. It wasn't really German. You know, I, I don't know what that meant. And so I only started understanding what that meant when I looked at your title. And so as a student, I'm like, oh, same day, something else, river, 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 dead guy. So I, I, I didn't feel like that drew me in. I like, and, and I can see the evil law, you know, am I evil, am I good when I get you through? But I didn't see that transitioning into, into your question. And I didn't see then how that connected to good states or all so it's like an essay. When I'm reading an essay, then I have this, some, this kind of a good body of content going on that's a lot, but I'm not really understanding why I'm reading it in the first place. It's interesting stuff I'm trying to pull out, and I'm wanting to pull stuff out, but I could so easily just switch switched up because I wasn't following exactly. So you've got a lot of good stuff, but you know, I, I, you know, we even wasted about ten minutes with you writing stuff on the board. I'm like, why write this on the board? Have it as a PowerPoint. Just slap it up. And there's a great picture of Bismarck, this evil genius or whatever, you know, or good statesman. Here's your question. Boom, reflections, bing, bang, boom. It's all there, but that's my introduction to the lesson. And you could even have a picture of Machiavelli and go, is he the ideal prince? And I'm like, oh, I'm with you. And so having that kind of thing draws me in, I'm with you, rather than looking at scratchy writing on the board that's kind of just thrown up there for me. I'm like, geez. And then, and that allows me, that allows you to keep it change it up and play and, and make it sexy but part of the job is drawing us in a little bit and one of the directions you give in the handout is you know uh, we will be having a classroom discussion on the materials and following the prompt da, da, da. nice prompt but it could, we could have linked it but leave look over the following materials leaving comments for after each document and you gave some great questions Brandon when you were telling us what we should do with the, with the document. But I was trying to write them down, and like Jeff said, I, I, I couldn't remember what I was supposed to do with them apart from read it. And then I was like, oh my gosh, and then there's five pages, and I'm a slow reader. I mean, not as slow as slow, obviously. She's not. But, you know, she's a graduate student, so she didn't get through the 15. And so I'm like, that's when I kicked into curtis. I'm like, maybe we should be, you know, having learning centers, or we should just break them up. And, and that should be it. And, and, and then we spent time analyzing it. What are the prompts we want to give them? What is it the things we could work with when we look at these primary sources? Because they are cool, because you spent a lot of time. And the thing is, some of them are really nice and short. We could still make some a little shorter, but there's some really cool things you could do with each one of these, and the kids could get, could get a lot out of it. And then when we do the fishbowl, you know, it's like, well, how much of the fishbowl? Do, do I really care about this, these comments? Curtis said, have, have four little fish bowls and each person does a little thing but the problem with that is 
how's it going to affect the gradient? Screw the gradient. Don't need to be checked the box. Go with the detail, get them to play, get them to enjoy, and you've got key questions around each one. And all of a sudden, it's going rather than going hurtful, negative, ooh, I'm not really listening anyway, blah, blah, blah. Ditch that, get them engaged, because then you can really move to the thesis. So there's so much good stuff, it's just like the tightness, just trying to put too much in, or trying to put it in, but not give it the structure that it needed. And I think these ways to play, because there is some good stuff, a lot of good stuff in here. It's just the refining, so, because I was worried that I was getting lost a little bit. Other comments? I think because we were having so much trouble with the documents, maybe it would have been cool if you scaffolded it the first one. Like if we had someone read it out loud and then uh, you had a pointed question about, okay, what was the point of view of this or that sort of thing. That could have helped too. Yeah. Give them something to work with. You could model it. Um, that's great idea. Thoughts, comments? Yes, sir. I think it's great. Um, yeah, uh, I, I appreciate all the comments. I think the one, the biggest thing that I had when I was looking at it and I was going through it was um, the how everything connected, like with the objective, with the guiding question, and all that stuff. And as I was teaching it, it was kind of coming around that the stuff doesn't connect as well as it could. I could definitely connect this a lot.